Hi, it's Misha again. And in this video, I want to kind of answer a question that I answer with a lot of customers, if not every day, at least a few times every week. What it really boils down to is, should I buy a US AK or an original import and why? So I don't have a whole lot of uh, US mid AKs in the store right now. It's been summer, we've been doing a lot of used guns. So, um, you know, I'm kind of thin on the ground here. And uh, even the import I wanted to show we were out of stock on, but I did my best to kind of show you. There are basically three different groups of semi AKs available in the US. We have the true imports, which are built overseas and brought over here. They're often converted in various ways to be more like military guns. This is an Arsenal SAM7 UF. This is built at the Circle 10 factory in Bulgaria and imported by Arsenal Inc. of Las Vegas. There are the guns that claim to be 100% US made from all US parts. This is one of them. This is what I consider to be one of the best. This is the Century Arms C39V2. They say it's made in the USA completely. That's sort of true. We'll get into the details in a bit. And then there's kind of a third category that started after the bands of the 80s and 90s. Guns built from imported parts kits by individuals or even companies. This is one here that I built. This is an East German kit built on a Nodak receiver. And you'll often see these guns because guns were never imported, so people have to build from kits. But we'll get into a little bit of the history. Now we have a companion video to this on the history of the AK imports. So if you're interested in import history, check that out. We're just gonna kind of talk about modern day. A few things happened, just to backtrack. 98, they basically put the kibosh on importing guns that took high capacity magazines. So they were bringing in low cap thumb hole guns. This spurred a lot of US manufacturers, importers, sellers to start converting guns over. What they would do, they would open up the mag wells, they would add a few US made parts, and after the sunset of the federal assault weapons ban in 2004, they would start doing things like bayonet lugs, threaded barrels, and even folding stocks, as on this one. At the same time, a lot of Eastern European countries were getting rid of their older AKs, and they were being cut up and sent over here and sold on the market as parts kits. This is probably most famous with a lot of the Yugoslavian Zastava M70 and 72 kits that flooded the market 15 years ago or more. Also, a lot of the so-called Romy G kits, Romanian G series type guns. These would come in as complete kits, less receiver. They would have the barrel. In fact, the whole front section would be intact. And then you'd have the stock section and then the internals. Well, in 2005, under the Bush administration, the Department of Treasury Customs, the ATF, reclassified barrels essentially to be the same as receivers and therefore not importable with um, with parts kits. So after 05, when kits were coming in, they would no longer have the original barrel. This is where the more modern style of parts kit with, in a big bag came from. Now over the years, parts kits have become more and more expensive to manufacture in the USA because they have to provide a barrel, they have to populate the barrel with all the components, they have to provide a receiver, and the kits themselves were getting harder to, to get and more expensive. That's where a lot of the US made 100% guns came from. Beginning in late 2004, Century Arms first offered their Wasser with a bayonet lug and threaded barrel right after the sunset. And in 05, they started to build guns from Yugoslavian parts kits. They would move on and build quite a few guns from parts kits over the years. Romanian guns, Yugoslavian, Bulgarian, even some Polish underfolder and fixed milds. They had some really nice builds. They would have U.S. barrels and receivers and U.S. trigger groups and sometimes U.S. furniture, but the rest of the parts would be foreign. But as the kits dried up and also as Century changed directions, they started to go to the 100% USA made guns. 
Other companies such as IO have done uh, have done much the same. PubMed, O State Armory, DDI have also gotten in on the game, although DDI, as we know, is no longer there. Other companies, such as Arsenal with this gun here, took a different tactic. They couldn't bring in parts kits. From about 2000 to 2006, Arsenal had been building guns from kits imported. Then they started importing thumbhole stock rifles again, as they had done in the 90s, and they would bring them over and deband them and sell them. So you get an imported gun with minimal interference done here in the USA just to make it legal. Whereas with the guns such as this, you have guns built from all US parts here in the USA from the get-go. And then I just brought this East German out to exemplify the guns built from parts kits. The barrel receiver would be USA made on most of the kit guns, although this one does have an original barrel, but most of the ones like this you'll see will have a US barrel and receiver, but then you'll have East German bolt group, sights, trunnions, furniture. So you still see quite a few of these on the market. I think there's quite a few people building Polish guns. I know Atlantic has some. So people ask me, which ones should they get? And I tell them categorically, get an import. And if the gun you don't, if the gun you want has never been imported or is no longer available, get a kit build from a quality manufacturer. I consider the USA built guns, 100% USA built guns, to be the, the last resort. And I'll try to tell you why as brief as I can. And as I said, these C39s are about the best they, that they do, at least for a budget. You, you can definitely get some of the higher end guns, but these uh, Century guns are right at about 700 now. Arsenals like this, the underfolders, are still being imported, although they have black polymer. This is mine, so it has the Bakelite on it. These tend to run about 1,200, so quite a bit more. And kit guns are all over, but most quality kit guns are 800 and up now. So why get the import? Well, it's pretty simple. A factory like Arsenal in Bulgaria started making AKs in the 60s. Some com companies got started earlier, some got started later, but m these, these foreign countries make guns and have been doing so for 50 plus years. They originally got their blueprints tooling from Soviet Russia, who obviously had the original pattern. They told them what kind of steel to use. They gave them the right jigs and machinery to do it. They even had Russian advisors in the factory for the first several years of production, making sure they were doing it right. So keep in mind, Russia took quite a few years to get the AK right. The earliest prototypes were in 1946, and then more or less the finalized prototypes were in late 47, with adoption and starting to be manufactured in 49. But even then, with the early AKs, they had issues. They changed them up with the Type 2s and then the Type 3s. And then they went to the AKM in 1959, which is the stamped receiver gun, much like this one over here. This is pretty much a German AKM. So in Russia, they took nearly 15 years to get the design where they wanted it. In that time, they had unlimited state resources. They had as many scientists, engineers, technicians testing. They could go out and run 10,000 rounds through a gun and they could do that 100 or 200 times over if they needed to. They had unlimited resources to figure out the best way to make a rifle and make it live, make it have a long lifespan. Hence why we have the features on here. A gun like this, and there are several different guns to be imported. Again, check out our import history video. But this particular one, we have a true hot die forged, hammer forged receiver. This is what is called a, often a milled receiver. It's all a single piece, including the train. We have a mill bolt group. We have a 16 inch cold hammer forged and chrome line barrel. This takes standard AK-47 handguards and pistol grip. This particular one has an underfolding stock. Now, the original AK-47 underfolder was a little different. Since this is a modern arsenal, it uses the more modern AKM style underfolder, which is an improvement, but that's really not here or there, but it is an original part. These come in with the stock folded up and a thumbhole stock on. 
They also come with the muzzle device, like a nut welded on here. And the bayonet lug isn't machined out here. It's just a straight block. And it has a thumb hole stock. And they have a few different ways of making the magwell low cap. Most often they just don't put a bullet guide in. Sometimes they put a little restrictor in either to not let a mag in at all or to make it a single stack mag. There's a few different methods. Either way they come in technically incapable of feeding from a high cap standard mag like this one. A company like Arsenal, once we get it in the country, they will pop the weld on the muzzle nut, unscrew it, put whatever device they want on there. They will take a machine, they'll just on each side, cutting out the sides for, to make the bayonet lug fully functional. They will get the mag weld back to spec, either adding a bullet guide or machining out the extra material that doesn't let the standard mag fit in. They'll pull off the thumb hole stock and put on a pistol grip and whatever butt stock they want. They do this one with a fixed stock, a couple of different lengths and colors. They also do it with a side folder and this one here with, is an under folder. I just to have this one because it was neat and actually surprisingly the Arsenal underfolders are among the cheaper of their of their offerings. So all of this gun is Bulgarian. The barrel is put into the receiver in Bulgaria. It's head spaced. It's it's proof tested in Bulgaria. You have people at the factory that have been doing it for years. All of their tooling is uh, from Soviet Russia or replaced, but either way they don't have any cost in the tooling. That's all long paid for by the military and government. They, you're using the correct military grade steels in the different parts. And a stamped gun, they have all the correct riveting jigs to do it right. It's, just, it's done like a military gun would be done. Yes, they have to make a few changes for import, but so what? Arsenal USA, Arsenal Inc. here in, in Las Vegas. What they do for these, they just add the minimum number of U.S. parts, which for a mill gun is usually five. They even preserve the original Bulgarian machine trigger group in these milled guns. Both stock is Bulgarian. And again, the interference is very minimal. Machining out a little metal in the magwell, machining out the bayonet lug, popping a weld. Everything else is done in Bulgaria. Is this as good as a pre-ban? Certainly not to collectors, but it's darn close because the work is still done overseas. These guns run. They run really well. They run for a long time, like a military AK would. The milled arsenals are also very slick, very well machined, very smooth. Double hook trigger, very light and nice. Now, the downfall to these, the, sometimes the finish is military grade. You might have some scuffs and scrapes. This also has a paint over park finish. Sometimes the paint will wear off, especially with certain solvents. Now in a military, the whole idea was, so what, repaint it. When it goes back into the arsenal, have it just repainted. But for civilians, some people don't like this. Another thing we hear about, especially more with the Wassers, are canted sights. Now understand, the AK front sight is meant to be adjustable. Windage and elevation. For a Soviet level mil spec, as long as it's not too far off center, as long as it can be adjusted to compensate for any kind of slight tilt, we're not talking, you know, 10 o'clock or 2 o'clock, you know, higgledy piggledy, but as long as it's off a few minutes of the clock, that's okay. That, that still meets their mil spec because the front sight can be adjusted to compensate. It may not be aesthetically pleasing, but it does fit within mil spec and it doesn't hurt anything because your sight can still be lined up with your rear. Also, let's be honest, most of you out there now probably use a red dot or even a scope on your AK. So the iron sights are mostly a cosmetic thing. So comparing that to a gun like the C39, the USA made. This is, as I said, a Century Arms. Other companies are also in on the game. They send these in big old American flag boxes, talking about that. So what goes into this? Well, we have a company, a privately owned company, in it to make a profit, 
who has been building AKs, first from parts kits for about the last 10 years, and more recently, the last couple of years, from virgin new parts that they say are all U.S. made. They have to do so on a budget. They have to pay their employees. They have to buy their tooling and machining. They do not have access to the original blueprints, tooling, or original Soviet Russian workers, as it were. They are basically reverse engineering AKs. So it's kind of similar to what happens in places like China or Pakistan or India where they reverse engineer. And just like there, it, it can either be a good or a bad thing depending on how, how well they did at it. Now remember, they're not making this for a military. They don't have any government support. They're making it to make a buck. And I get why they started, because imports were becoming more uh, troublesome, harder to get in the country, more sporadic. That's the nature of imports. They're here, they're gone. Even parts kits were getting harder, and once you took the barrels out of the kits, it made building them so much more difficult, time-consuming, and expensive. So, yeah, why not make one here in the U.S.? I get that. I really do. But these are basically designed and being built by amateurs. So what do we have? We have a, on the C-39, a milled receiver. Whereas the Arsenal was a hot die, this is actually a block that is originally cast. And then it's machined down to its original, uh, uh, final shape. Kind of like a Ruger Mini 14 receiver or a Springfield M1A. There's nothing wrong with it. But it's not a true milled. It's a cast that's milled into final shape. The receivers actually seem pretty good, but you know. We have a 16 inch barrel. This is not cold hammer forged. Most of these US guns are not chrome lined either. Most do not have a bayonet lug. Most are threaded. This is also threaded 14 millimeter with this removable brake. This one does have front and rear sling swivels. Others I've seen do not, not of this pattern, but other US ones. This does have a side rail, although it's a little bit different spec. I've read quite a few mounts either require some fitting to go on or just don't want to go on at all. You can tell the gas block is a very different shape. It's very squared off. This is a cast gas block. This is a cast front sight. That's okay. Uh, later in production in Russia, Poland, and Romania, amongst others, they would go to cast gas blocks and front sights. What they would never do is go to cast front and rear trunnions. So now that we're on a milled receiver, we don't have trunnions. But if you look at a USA May gun like the IO-247 or the Century RAS-47, they have trunnions you always want to make sure the trunnions are forged. You do not want to go to a cast trunnion on an AK. There are a few sources out there that claim that some com block nations did. This is not true. None of the Eastern European nations went to cast trunnions. They always forged them. Just to be clear on that. The same thing goes with the bolt group. Originally, Century and IO tried to get away with casting not only the bolt carrier, but the bolt itself. Even they decided very quickly this was not going good, and they did go to a forged bolt. Again, overseas, they would always use a forged bolt. This is just how the AK design works, because all of your force is essentially in your front trunnion area, or in a milled receiver, your locking surface area, and on your bolt head. The problem with casting, and I am not a metallurgist, please don't think so. There are guys out there that know infinitely more about metal than I do. But the problem, amongst many others, are inclusions, little tiny air pockets that get in there during the casting process. Essentially, it's just hard to make sure that cast parts have the same uniformity and consistency, not just from part to part, but from batch to batch and year to year. You have to be very careful about it 
which companies like Ruger historically always have been. Ruger is probably one of the best companies at casting frames and receivers because they've been doing it since the 70s and they put the time and the research into how to do it right. Have companies like Century and IO done this? I honestly don't know. So I'm not going to speak to that. But I do know it does take some planning and equipment and meticulous quality control to cast properly. What I can tell is this furniture they've started putting on not only the C39, but also the Wasser 10 and the NPAPS is close to junk. This is very lightweight. I almost call it popsicle stick or balsa wood, although I think it is technically beech. It's a very light, porous wood, and it is not mill spec. It is not tough. It will wear out. And that's bad on an AK because the rear stock is held in with friction and two screws. So if the screws warp out or the, the fit gets loose, even, even if your screws are in there fine, if the fitment, if the stock waller is in there, it can get loose. Your upper handguard is simply held on to the gas tube with two thin flanges, one here, one here. So if those break or get loose, it's loose. And your lower handguard is held on with one large block down here and a flange up here. So there's a lot of places where the wood, if it's not nicely hardened wood, will wear. And this is, just by feeling it, is about cheap as possible you can get type wood. But of course, with the C39V2, it takes standard AKM, AK74 furniture, and with the original C39, it took standard AK7, AK47 milled furniture. So furniture is easy to replace out along with this ridiculous looking pistol grip that Century has been using for a long time now. Just ugly. What the C39 and many other US made AKs give you are a very nice cosmetic appearance. They tend to have nice parked finishes or even blued. This wood I'm sure looks nice. It's smooth. It's not the battlefield beat up wood. It looks good. The sights are almost always straight on these. So the, the, the cosmetics of these are very nice. But the question is longevity. My Romanian SAR-1, which we've had in quite a few videos, is getting very close to 10,000 rounds and I have never replaced a single part. Could a gun like this or an RAS-47 make it to 10,000 rounds? I don't know. I'm not sure who does. The guns have been out so briefly and most owners haven't shot that much. Most people who buy these usually buy them in gun stores and they buy them because they want an AK. That's fine. I have lots of AKs and a lot of them I don't even get to shoot maybe once a year. So I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying with something like this arsenal, I'm very confident that it would make it to 10,000 or more rounds like my SAR-1. A gun like this, I just don't know. It's a new, it looks like an AK, but the manufacturing techniques and the people behind it are not the same people who designed the AK. It's in the shape of an AK, but the longevity just hasn't been proven yet. It's the claims of the whole USA made thing, sort of. What a lot of these companies are doing they're actually bringing in incomplete forgings or castings, oftentimes castings if it's Korea, or wood stock sets that are unfinished, bringing them over from Korea, other places overseas, and they're finishing them out here in the USA and calling them US made. I know a while back there was a company in Korea that was exposed as, as sending um, uh, excuse me, sending uh, cast, incomplete, raw castings over, and they are being used by IO and a couple of other companies, it's slipping my mind right now. But you know, things like this, um, this block here. If nothing else, a lot of the USA made AKs are using parts from the same subcontractors. Like this gas block looks the same basically as the one on the IO 247. When you set up to make all these parts in the US, it's a very expensive proposition. Just machining a front sight base can get costly. Even casting it, doing it right. I admire what they're trying to do, especially for the shooting public. 
I really do because imports end. Anytime someone asks me about an import like this, I say get it if you want it, get it now. This is most recently borne out by the Vepers. Something always happens to foul up imports. Either the American company importing them goes under or quits importing them, as is what's happened with a lot of the IO guns like the Archer. Or the foreign company goes out of business or the foreign government says no more. Or the cost just goes high enough that it's not worth doing. Or sanctions happen, as most recently with Russia. Things get in the way of imports. So if you want a gun that's imported, like the Arsenal, you need to, you need to grab it. If not that day, at least, you know, if you want it, get serious about it. So the idea of making it 100% AK in the U.S. is a good idea from that standpoint. If someone can really get... Actually, I wouldn't say someone. We need a couple. We need to say three. Three companies need to make them here. And they need to do a, well, a good job of it. And by competition, it'll keep the prices down and the quality up. So I understand that. And in a few years, once they get the process down, it might be worth it. Now, to a collector like myself, I, I shoot, as you know, but I'm, I really like the history. A gun like this really is lacking in history. I can look at it, think it's a nice gun. These milled receivers are actually pretty good. I don't know, are they still made by a ATM? They were the original makers of milled receivers for Century. They did those Polish 1960 guns. That was probably one of Century's best, and that was built with Polish parts. But either way, these receivers have borne out to be pretty good. The barrels, they're not going to have the longevity, although because of the way they're made, not being chrome-lined, they may actually be a little more accurate. Hard to say. It's kind of a gun-to-gun -gun thing. But right now, the imported AK is still superior. And prices are still pretty commensurate. This is about 700 For about the same money, you can get a Romanian-made Wasser 10, which has the same qualifications and uh, background as that arsenal. Built overseas, cold hammer forge, chrome line barrel. Original receiver, it's stamped. Or for about $50 less, for about $650 right now, you can get a NPAP, NPAP, which is built over in Serbia by Zastava. It has a lot of the same features, except it doesn't have a chrome line barrel. That's not because they were cutting corners, it's just over in Serbia, they, they didn't ever chrome their 762 by 39 barrels. They do chrome their uh, 556 barrels, 223 though, for some reason. So there are imports priced the same as this or even cheaper. So you don't have to get a $1,200 arsenal. You can still get an MPAP or a Wasser right now. In the past, there have been others, but right now the import market's kind of low. The, um, you know, in the past, the Russian guns were, were pretty affordable, but that, that's, that's long gone. So that's why I tell people when they ask me why they should get an import if they can afford it. Oh, I completely forgot. Another good import that's right around the same price point is the Arsenal SLR 107 R, which is a fixed stocked stamped receiver gun that just got released this year. They're about 800 to 850, so only about $100 more and you get a true Arsenal gun. So that's that's my interpretation. Now, there are a few cases by the way, these come from Century. Century shipping all their AKs right now with Magpul Gen 1 P mags. Um, they're perfectly fine range mags. I, they're not serious mags. That's why Magpul did the Gen 2, which is quite a bit better. Now there are some cases, for example, this gun here, where no East German AK semi-autos were ever imported. The only thing we ever had were parts kits. This goes for a lot of the earlier mill guns. It also goes for a lot of the more obscure guns. So with a gun like this, the best you can do if you want a gun, and a German gun in this case, in your collection is to get a good parts kit and build it up. And there are still a number of Polish kits and Romanian kits and Yugoslavian kits in the country. And you'll find quite a few people building them. This gun kind of falls in between the two extremes. It is not built overseas. It is built in the U.S usually on a U.S. receiver, almost always today with the U.S. barrel. 
It's also riveted together, tested, and all that in the U.S. They do tend to have pretty, pretty good finishes on them, if not excellent. They do tend to be pretty straight because these are built by hand as opposed to an assembly line most of the time. So you still get a lot of the, the physical nice looks of the C39 with the kit build, but on the other hand, you still get a lot of foreign made parts in these. Most notably the truly forged machine trunnions. You get a forged bolt group, bolt. You get the original gas block, which in this case is also a machine forged. Original sight. You get original furniture, which is gonna be as durable as any other military furniture. So basically what a kit gun comes down to is the, the quality of the builder. Who built it, how much in a hurry they were. The problem now is these are getting pretty expensive. Now, I, I just a, if you buy it from say Atlantic Firearms, you can usually get one for still under a thousand. It'll be nice. But if you go to do a custom build, AK builders are starting to charge pretty high prices. There are pretty long wait times. So there are downsides to doing a truly, uh, truly custom build now. And again, since you need to use a uh, US barrel these days, it makes building them a lot more time consuming. Back when you, they had the original barrels, you could do it quite quickly, really in an afternoon, because all you had to do was uh, rivet a few things and this and that. <laughs> but uh, times change. If in a few years, someone asked me, which they said buy, if the imports continue to get harder to find and the prices go up, I might suggest a US gun, especially if they've been on the market a little longer and have proven themselves. Right now though, while Wasser prices along with all the other imports have gone up, it is worth noting that Arsenal's prices have stayed pretty rock steady. Arsenal hasn't changed their pricing much for now. I don't know what's gonna happen with the whole Vepper Fine thing, but for right now, Arsenal's are about the same price they have been for the last, uh, if not 10 years, at least uh, seven or eight years. So yeah, that's a question I get asked a lot in the gun shop and over the phone and emails, and I wanted to give my two cents. That's just my opinion, of course, but um, I like knowing with a gun like this that it came from the real factory. I also like kind of feeling the, the history, the Bulgarian factory that was over in communist Russia and, and all that goes with. Finally, a gun like this will become collectible. Imports will end. When they do, they go up in price. A gun like this, about the only time you're going to see a marked increase in value, worth, is if there's another scare, as what happened after Sandy Hook, when people are buying anything AK or AR shaped. It just doesn't have the history behind it. I'm also just concerned about the cast parts, because when you start casting, you might have 10 guns, and eight of them might work great because the parts don't have inclusions or other imperfections. And you might have two that just, just don't because of the quality. I, I just don't know. Again, very new to the market. That said, they usually do have a little bit better fit and finish, especially if you're not shooting a lot. So that might be a concern. If you really want a nice, perfectly even park finish, you might go that way. You know, they, they, do, they do do that for them. And obviously, since it is built in the U.S., if you ever need to get replacement parts, they're, they're right here. Well, I'm sure there's more I could add, but I think I've rambled on long enough. That's, this is a video, I think, when people ask me this question in the future, I'll point them here, and then they can watch it and call me back when they have more questions. But as of right now, that's what I, uh, what I feel, what I think. I have been messing around with AKs for a few years now. I've been in it about 20 years and seen a lot of imports come and go and a lot of kit builds come and go. And... I've got a good good amount of trigger time with these guns. And what I like about the AK is it's just its history, its dependability, and its reliability. And US ones do not have the history, and their dependability and reliability are still, um, still being tested. If accuracy and all that is what you need, get an AR. America makes fantastic ARs. In the end, that's what I would say is my closing advice. Buy an American AR. This is where the era came from. If you want an AK, try to get something either from Russia or something from Eastern Europe or China where they made the, you know, the AK and developed the AK. I tend to buy stuff in its uh, country of origin or at least where it's from. You know, 
They, they've been doing it. They know how to do it best. Well, as always, we really appreciate you tuning in. Just one final time, that was my opinion. So if you don't agree, I understand. Uh, I'd love to hear your, uh, your own thoughts and, and feelings in the comments. Uh, have a friendly discussion over it because I'm definitely uh, not always right. And um, I'm always open for new information. And it seems like every month there's new info on these U.S.-made guns. So let's talk about that. If you like the video, appreciate it if you click like. If you have, any, if you have not already subscribed, appreciate it if you could do that too. Well, please tune in again next time for more hopefully unique and uh, interesting gun videos. We'll catch you then.